Bonjour, euh, je m'appelle David Malone, euh, j'ai l'honneur de travailler ici. June, my, David, my name is David Malone and I do work here at IDRC. The conference will be held in English, but we do have simultaneous interpretation. We have headphones if you need them. And if you have any questions as well, and you would like to ask your questions in French, or you have comments, and you prefer to make those comments in French, please do not hesitate. And uh, if necessary, I will translate them for Mrs. Tapa. Privilege of working here at the International Development Research Center. We're uh, tremendously honored uh, as one of our speakers of renown in visiting uh, Canada in part to help us celebrate our 40th anniversary, both here and in Toronto, I'm glad to say. Uh, we have Dr. Romila Thapar. I say she's in Canada in part to visit us because she was receiving an honorary doctorate at the University of Alberta earlier in the week. Uh, and in a sense, we're piggybacking on that very happy event because attracting her to Canada wouldn't have been easy to do, I suspect, uh, otherwise. Uh, as you'll all know from um, the, the promotional material for uh, this exchange, uh, she's had a very distinguished career, culminating with all sorts of honors uh, at this stage uh, of her life. Uh, she started off with a BA from the University of Punjab. She then went and, and, and undertook that very uh, British uh, next step of a BA on in uh, uh, London, and she got her PhD. Uh, from the University of London. Uh, she taught at the University of London, but she's also taught at several Indian university, uh, Indian universities. Uh, Kurukshetra, which I don't know, uh, Delhi University, which I do know, and of course JNU, the uh, Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University, which became her base in 1970, and of which she's been a professor emerita since uh, 1993. Her first book uh, was uh, Ashoka and the Decline of the Mauryas. We were chatting earlier. And as you might have guessed, it was her doctoral uh, thesis um, revisited, doubtless, for publication. She's written so much else, I'm not going to embarrass her by reading it out. But uh, I thought I'd, I'd mention a couple of recent publications of hers, not necessarily her thickest volumes, but they give an idea of some of her recent preoccupations. Uh, one was called Problems of Historical Writing in India, to which she contributed. And uh, recently, um, uh, The Aryan Recasting con uh, Constructs, and it, it involved uh, essays. She has received uh, honorary doctorates from all sorts of uh, universities. I just mentioned the University of Alberta. I should mention the University of Hyderabad in India also, and there have been other honorary doctorates in India. Uh, but in uh, the West, the University of Chicago, Oxford, Edinburgh, and I could go on, but that would simply uh, embarrass us and take away uh, from, uh, embarrass her and take away from the time for the conversation. In 2008, she won the Kluge Prize, uh, which is administered by the Library of Congress. It's the great prize for uh, historians, uh, a very rich prize, which she shared uh, that year uh, with one other. For historians, it just doesn't get any better prize-wise uh, than the Kluge Prize. So I personally was thrilled uh, she received it. Um, we were friends when I was living in India. I felt very privileged to be able to know her in India. And when I learned I was coming to IDRC, I started plotting on how we might induce her uh, to visit us here in Ottawa. And she has now uh, consented. Uh, Romila, I thought I'd start off um, 
uh, with, with an event in my life. Just yesterday, I received a phone call from a friend at the University of Alberta, who's actually a board member of IDRC, who said, you know, I heard the most fabulous convocation address, uh, and it turned out to be by Romola. So I wanted to ask you whether you could perhaps pick up one or a couple of the themes from your convocation address, and then we'll move on to have a bit of a chat, but then we'll rapidly open it up to friends in the room. Well, uh, thank you very much, David. I should really begin by saying that I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that I took David seriously and decided to <laughs> accept his invitation. Um, the, ed the address at the University of Alberta was a brief one. And uh, there were two themes that I really touched on. Uh, one was that uh, we, uh, societies like ours, which have been through a colonial experience and have then emerged as independent nation states, um, have problems facing historians, which is that there was a colonial construction of Indian history, and when I use the word Indian, I mean the subcontinent. Uh, there was a colonial construction of Indian history which touched on different aspects, uh, primarily aspects of race, uh, language, caste, religion, and questions of poverty, and were explained, these aspects were explained from the point of view of colonial policy. And we accepted a lot of these constructions as fundamentally important to our own uh, uh, acceptance of the history of the subcontinent. Since then, however, my generation of historians has been busy trying to explore these constructions and see how many of them actually had validity. To what, ex what extent were these constructions determined by colonial policy, and to what extent are they actually uh, valid in their own right on the basis of evidence and um, data that we get from the past? And of course, in my case, where I'm dealing with the ancient history of the subcontinents, the continent, the evidence is basically manuscripts and texts, inscriptions of which there is a huge number in India, and archaeological exploration. So one of the issues is that in the search for what is these days very fashionably called identity, which we're all going through, whether as nations or as fragments of nations, uh, how much of this identity is based on historical interpretation and reconstruction of the past? and how much of the past continues into the present. That was one aspect I touched on. <clears throat> the other aspect I touched on was that we talk about globalization today, and it is valid, but I also like to talk about something that I call proto-globalization, which is that if one looks at the history of Eurasia and Africa in, let's say, the year AD 1000, the networks right across Eurasia are enormous and link up all kinds of places and activities, from Tunis in North Africa to Canton in South China, from the Gobi Desert in Central Asia to the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean. There are recognizable cultures, and cultures that are talking to each other are in dialogue. You have traders crossing across, uh, going across mountains and uh, sailing across seas. And together with the traders go the missions, the monks, the teachers, and so on, bringing new ideas, and the scholars. And scholarship, which we assume is something which is singular and comes out of a particular culture, in fact is the result of a huge interflow of different kinds of cultures and thoughts and ideas. So these are the two points that I was emphasizing, and they're very much points that are dear to my heart as a historian. Terrific. Well, uh, why don't we dig into one or two of them before uh, we open up. Uh, much of your own uh, work 
has been, uh, unless I'm mistaken, on early civilizations in the Indus Valley uh, area. And I wanted to ask you what conclusions you started drawing from this early uh, combination of field work and your more theoretical uh, background. Uh, well, one of the things that attracted me most to the Indus civilization was the whole question of the nature of a sophisticated urban culture. It was a culture that was based very much on commerce and agriculture. Uh, one of the startling things was that they used plow agriculture very extensively, which was something new and different. Uh, nevertheless, and they had contacts with places right up in Central Asia and the Pamirs, in Oman, where they have found copper mining with Harappan settlements nearby. So obviously the Harappans were going down and mining copper. Uh, and in Mesopotamia, there are references to people coming from the east from a land called Meluha, which we think might have been the Sumerian version of an Indian place name. That's speculation at the moment. But anyway, I was interested in what, is, uh, what are the kinds of issues that are involved in the gradual change from agro-pastoralism to farming, which went on in the northwest of uh, the Indian subcontinent, to ultimately this outburst of cities uh, spread all over northwestern India. Uh, spread to the extent that there is a stream of these cities in what is now Pakistan and large numbers of these cities across the border in India, in North Rajasthan, in Gujarat, in Punjab and Haryana. And as I was saying over lunch, one of the tragedies is that we're digging on both sides of the borders. We're dying to know what the Pakistanis are finding on their sites, and they're dying to know what we're finding on our sites. But we have to come to Europe and America to actually follow the reports, because there isn't that communication. And it would be rather marvelous if archaeologists from both sides could cross the border and, and go and dig at these uh, city sites. Uh, the Harappan civilization then is an urban civilization which declines, which comes to arise in about 2600 BC, declines in 1700 BC or thereabouts, and there seems to be a hiatus, but in fact there wasn't a hiatus. What you get is a scatter of settlements, largely of pastoralists and agriculturalists. Uh, that continue to survive till a later period. And that is the point in time when the Vedic literature was composed. Hymns and various other ritual texts and so on were put together. And the question that often arises is that was there anything from the Harappan civilization that was taken over into the later civilizations? and to the later cultures. And this raises a very fundamental question in historical research these days, which is how do cultures transmit what they think is important from their own culture, which then declines to another culture which is on the rise? And this process of transmission then becomes a very fundamental process and is also fundamental to the kinds of ideas that we are now pushing for, which is that identities, which are essential to all cultures, whether they be sophisticated urban cultures or agro-pastoral cultures like the Vedic cultures, identities are never permanent and never unchanging. Identities constantly change. And so one of the interests that we have as historians is to see precisely how these identities change. Um, Romila, I was thinking uh, this morning, actually, of, because I was reviewing your list of publications, I was actually thinking of Ashoka and how when I was living in India, I noticed that the interpretations of Ashoka, so to speak, uh, tended to be more projections onto the historic figure of Ashoka of what people thought a great king should be than necessarily what Ashoka was. 
And so I wanted to ask you what you think the significance of the historic figure uh, Ashoka was, in yes. fact. Well, this projection, of course, is something which is common, I think, to all societies. <laughs> That's part of the function of the past, which plays into the present. We like to think of certain values of the present, and we impose them back on people of the past. And this is something that kings in particular suffer from. <laughs> uh, they are constantly being made to, um, a, a, you know, to have these values pushed onto them. Um, in the case of Ashoka, it's quite interesting, of course, because uh, he um, ruled practically the whole of the subcontinent in the third century BC. Uh, issued a large number of edicts which were inscribed on rocks and on beautifully crafted pillars all over the subcontinent, virtually. In fact, not just the subcontinent, but in Afghanistan as well. His edicts in Afghanistan was inscribed in Greek and Aramaic, which was a the language then being used in those areas. The rest of them were inscribed in Prakrit. Um, and um, in, uh, located literally from the northwest right down uh, almost to the south, certainly as, as, as far as Karnataka today. Um, my work on Ashoka began with wanting to look at the edicts and read the man through the edicts, whereas previously most historians had said, oh yes, he writes, he, in these edicts, he declares himself to be a Buddhist. Therefore, what the Buddhists have to say about him is important. And if you look at the Buddhist texts, which are partly the, the chronicles from Sri Lanka, the monastic chronicles from Sri Lanka, uh, Buddhist texts from the Northwest, they all depict him as an extremely pious Buddhist. They depict him as a very powerful king and part of his power and part of his greatness lay in the fact that he was the patron, the great patron of the Buddhist Sangha, the Buddhist order. Therefore, very important to the history of Buddhism. And there was this great debate amongst earlier historians as to was he really a Buddhist? How much of a Buddhist was he? Was he more of a Hindu? Uh, was he, in fact, propagating both? Brahmanical and Buddhist ideas, and so on. When I started reading the edicts, it struck me that he was talking to two bodies of people, and I think this is fairly clear in the edicts. One is that he's addressing himself to the Buddhist Sangha, where he says, uh, I want you all, monks and nuns, to live in complete harmony. There should be no dissent amongst you. And if there is dissent, those who dissent, are to be robed in white robes and expelled from the monastery. <laughs> and so quite clearly there were dissenting groups at that time, which is the interesting factor. The other lot of ed edicts, the major ones, both in number and in terms of what he's saying, uh, are addressed to the public at large, in which he is arguing for some acceptance of Buddhist principles, but he doesn't actually talk about the teachings of the Buddha. He talks about the Dhamma, which was the, Pali, the Prakrit word for Dharma, which means the social ethic in this case. And what he is really talking about is that he says that each man should respect the other man's sect or teaching, because by respecting the other teaching, you are giving more respect to your own teaching. Now, this struck me as being a very powerful message of coexistence, even though coexistence by itself is not enough. You have to also say, because each sect has an equal status, which he doesn't say. He simply says, you must respect each text. He is against violence. There is the famous edict of the end of the campaign in Kalinga, where mm. he turns around and says that I have given up violence. But there is a caveat. I hope that my sons and grandsons will also forswear violence, but in case they have to be violent and to fight wars, I hope they will be merciful in their punishments. So th <laughs> there is this interesting kind of practicality that comes into what I have argued is that he was not just a Buddhist, he was a Buddhist and a statesman. And therefore there is this constant interaction, 
pulling, pushing, bringing together, pulling apart, which goes on in these kinds of situations. What is remarkable about the man is that he put this teaching across, uh, he stood by this teaching, and in a sense, the post-Mauryan period in India from the second century BC to the third, fourth centuries AD is a period in which Buddhism becomes a very powerful religion. Well, uh, I went to Kalinga, and I had some of your writing in your two-volume work on early Indian history in mind when I was there. It was actually a thrilling it place a to yes. go to yes. uh, in a very beautiful state, uh, Orissa, with wonderful people. Um, when I read uh, Indian history at first, of course, it was Indian his history by Brits. That's yes. what we all read we all uh, early I, on. I, w I was brought up on those. <laughs> and I think many of them tried to be uh, very uh, straightforward. Um, but obviously, what, what was very striking to me coming at it in the, the, the early, early uh, third millennium was how many excuses they found for the British colonizers. Yes. And uh, it was very easy to justify the actions of British visitors to India. More importantly, though, I wanted to ask you what you think the principal distortions were mm -hmm. of colonial history in India, and, and what have you and others been trying to correct since then? Yeah. That's a very big question. <laughs> I, could, I could go on for hours on that. Uh, let me say at the outset that one is um, very uh, appreciative, deeply appreciative, of the amount of sheer scholarship and grit that went into the rediscovery of data. Uh, the inscriptions, for example, could no longer be read, the early inscriptions. And it was a British engineer who sat down and deciphered the Brahmi script, and that is how we were able to read the inscriptions of Ashoka. Uh, secondly, they began to excavate sites, and there was the tangible evidence of history that came out of the earth uh, with these excavations. And thirdly, there was an attitude of organizing and ordering the manuscript and textual data which had been really not done on any scale before because people picked up texts, scholars picked up texts as and how they were interested in a particular subject and there, there it, it was left. And it was the British scholars, largely in fact officers of the East India Company and later, who sat down and really organized all this material. And one is very appreciative of that. But, however, it's the reading of that material which is really problematic because they tended to read it very much naturally from the point of view of the culture and civilization that they came from, which was Gre Greco-Roman and Christian Europe, just about turning into the Enlightenment and bringing in those kinds of views. Um, and, and that was very important. And that was very important, for example, in their study of religion. But the other weakness in the interpretation was that they wanted to use history as part of colonial policy. And that was when they made the argument repeatedly that Indian civilization was unique because it didn't have a sense of history. <laughs> and that was one thing that triggered off my interest in the book that I'm currently working on when I asked myself this question that how can you have a complex, sophisticated civilization and not have a sense of history? Every society has a sense of history. So that this really was something that was quite unacceptable. And their argument, it seems, was largely because if you said that there was no sense of history amongst Indians, you could construct a history for them. And you would construct the history that suited your policy and your needs. And that is why some of us began to argue that some of their constructions were constructions that were based on the needs of colonial policy. Now, let me give you some examples. Um, 
their major interest in the beginning was not so much in history per se, as we would treat it today, but in texts on religion and texts on the social codes, the Dharma Shastras. The texts on religion that they, they favored were the Vedic texts. These were the earliest texts in Vedic Sanskrit. When they asked their, um, uh, the, the scholars as to which were the earliest texts, the most important, they said the Vedas, the Pandits. <coughs> so the Brahman Pandits suggested the Vedas and they read them with the Brahman Pandits, with the Brahman Pandits explaining to them the meaning of the text until such time as their own knowledge of, English, of, of Sanskrit became um, sufficient for them to understand. Now, the point is, therefore, that the reading of these texts came from a very particular group of people, of specialists, ritual specialists, of the Brahman elite, and of people who kept insisting that the only thing worth knowing from ancient India were the Sanskrit texts. So they happily ignored all the other texts in the other languages until much later. Buddhism, for example, comes into importance almost till, uh, not till the end of the 19th century. It is then that the interest of Buddhism develops. Uh, mind you, at a time when they're excavating Buddhist sites and discovering stupas and monasteries all over the place, yet the connection is not being made that these stupas and monasteries belong to a religion about which they really didn't know too much. And it was much later that this religion began, that their knowledge about this began to develop. Um, so there was this um, uh, problem in, in, in the, the study of these texts. Uh, secondly, there was also the question that because they were looking only at Sanskrit texts, they had a particular view of Indian religion which didn't cover the entire body of religious articulation. It left out, for example, uh, the non-Sanskritic groups like the Buddhists and the Jains and so on. It left out the Muslims to a large extent. Uh, that was almost deliberate because the argument, the, again, as part of colonial policy, the argument was that the Hindus were conquered by the Muslims in around 1200 AD and were tyrannized by Muslim rule. Consequently, the Hindus were very grateful for the arrival of the British that released them from the tyranny of Muslim rule. This then led to their basic assumption that the Hindus and the Muslims have always been hostile and antagonistic towards each other. There wasn't really enough interest in saying wait a minute, are we really talking only about religion or are we talking about society? Are we talking about the wider dimensions of society? Now, if that had come in, then they would have realized that what they called Hinduism, which they based very much initially on the structure of Judeo-Christian traditions and religions, was a totally different kind of religious experience. Hinduism is a mosaic of sects and cults. And what is important is not the orthodoxy of the text. What is important, important is the practice of the sect. And the sect often coincides with the caste. In the old days, before you had the kind of uniformization that is taking place now, you could go to a ritual in a village or in some part of town, observe the ritual, and then say, oh yes, it's this caste that belongs to this sect that is performing this ritual. Because that act of practice was extremely important and very central. And this is one aspect that I think was missed out on. There wasn't enough um, attention given to this. In fact, there's a split in the scholarship. You have the people who are the experts on the texts, doing very fine philological research, excellent philological research. And you have the others who are observing religious practice who are called ethnographers. Because somehow, the non-textual practice was in some ways kind of primitive, and therefore was left to ethnography. 
Now, the ethnographers, and those who studied the texts of the religion, didn't get into a dialogue and try and understand whether there was any overlap or link between these different practices. And the interesting thing about the practices, if one looks even at the census of, I think it was 1880 that the first census was held, but around then, um, if you look at the da data that comes from there, there are differences. There are differences of religion at the elite levels, very distinct identities of religion, where the Hindus are describing, describing themselves as Vaishnavs, Shaivs, Shaktas, uh, Tantrics, whatever it may be, the sect, the major sect that they belong to, and then the subsect, of course. At the lower level, that is about 60 to 70 percent of the population below the elite, there's very much of a mixture. Who goes to the temple? Who goes to the mosque? You have lots of castes returning themselves as Muslim. And when they're asked, uh, how many times do you go to the mosque to pray? They say, well, on festival days, occasionally I go there. Which festivals do you observe? And they list all the Hindu festivals. <laughs> because at that level, there is a communication, a living together, as it were which is very important. Now, this is what gets left out. And in this reconstruction, then, of what is called Hinduism, uh, what emerges is a rather strange creature, which I think a person of the pre-modern period would not have fully recognized. But we've inherited that, and we go on with that reconstruction. And today, we swear by that reconstruction without pausing to think that maybe, as always in history, everywhere in the world, religions keep on changing. They change their forms, they get reformulated, they break into a variety of sects, the sects get on or don't get on with each other. All of this is part of pulsating history. And this is really what we miss out on if we simply take that construction and carry on with it. And that's one of the things that, that I feel concerned about when we talk about identities. Uh, when we today describe ourselves as Hindu or Muslim or Sikh or whatever it may be, we should be aware of the fact that this is not the same identity that existed in 1000 BC or 1000 AD or whatever it may be. This is an identity of the present. Thank you, Ramla. I think what we'll do is open up the debate to others uh, in the room. There are microphones on either side, as you'll observe. So anybody wanting to make a remark or ask a question, please come up to one of the microphones, identify yourself, and uh, please let us know what's on your mind. I'll just make a final comment from me. When I was working with a terrific young Indian student of Indian history who you know, Taru Dalmia, we were both struck by how obsessed a number of the uh, British historians were by lines of division in mm. India. Mm. And of course, division was the friend of the colonist yeah. because yeah. largely the British, without huge numbers of manpower of their own, uh, were able to uh, dominate the subcontinent by divide and rule uh, tactics. So that was something recent to me. Please, sir. Hello, I'm Nan Tandon, a retired civil servant and a student of current affairs, not of history. When I was in India, I was an avid reader of a magazine seminar started by your brother. And I was never able to see him. I'm glad I haven't been able to see you. Uh, I'm not a patch on him. <laughs> uh, uh, after independence for about half a century, what in India are known as secular Marxist historians had almost a complete sway over establishment for about half a century, uh, including the educational institutions. And yet, when I go on the internet and see the um, postings there are blogs and things like that, it seems that the generations which have, which have been come out of that stream of education has not been very much swayed by 
that uh, post-colonial construct of history that you mentioned, they seem, seem to be more impressed by the colonial construct, especially the uh, people belonging to Hindu majority. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is, uh, is it necessary to have a common um, narrative of history for communal harmony in India? And if it is so, could that be achieved by some kind of a um, historical truth and reconciliation commission? <laughs> I was thinking not only of South Africa, but of the kind of model that seminar itself presented. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, maybe for those that were not readers of seminar, um, the idea was that you took one problem every month and uh, the opening uh, essay explored the problem and then there were half a dozen other essays that took up different aspects so that by the time you'd finished reading the whole uh, magazine, you had some little idea of what the problem was about. Um, and it, it really was, I, th I think, quite a brilliant magazine and, and did some very good work in those days. Um, ab about about your, your question, um, yes, there was a lot of interest in a secular Marxist historiography from the 1960s onwards. I think one of the things that has to be kept in mind is the rather subtle divide, perhaps it's not so subtle anymore, the divide between scholarly historical writing and what you read on the internet, which is not always reflective of the scholarly historical writing. Um, in a sense, people have argued that the internet was captured by a kind of popular tradition that went back to the colonial ideas and reformulated them in the garb of Hindutva and presented those. Now, what has happened actually with the, with the, with the scholarly writing is that in, in many of the universities, much more than before, and the, and, the, and the number of history departments that are doing this has grown, which is something of, of comfort to us that even though you don't have a continuation of um, a Marxist historical tradition, there is something of a secular historical tradition which has come in at the level of scholarship. That people are moving away from the age-old explanations that you, know, uh, you had, for example, when, when there is a discussion on caste, it used to be said, oh yes, there were four castes, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaish, Shudra, and these were their functions, and this is how they functioned right through the subcontinent for all time. Now that kind of thing has been seriously questioned, and is still being questioned, even by those who have no affiliation with Marxism as such. But what has happened is that there is the entry of what is sometimes called an interdisciplinary sense of history. So that, you know, if you have sociologists and social anthropologists who are also asking questions of caste, and if students are told, you don't just read the Manudharm Shastra, but you also read people who've commented on it, uh, not only in ancient times, but in present days. So the student is forced to read social historians, sociologists, social anthropologists, and so on, and the, the way in which caste is being understood changes. Now, that is happening at the level of universities, some universities at least, and I think it's really uh, quite impressive, some of the writing that is coming out in the form of articles in, in uh, good quality journals. And that. But on the internet, and this is of course the problem with the internet, that it's open to anybody to put in anything they like. <laughs> you have all kinds of fabrications being brought in. And the problem is that for even the intelligent, ordinary person who's not a historian, who goes to the internet to get some information, gets a mix of very finely uh, conceived thinking plus garbage. Now, how do you separate the two? So my answer usually is, for God's sake, don't depend on the internet, read books. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for your points. I'm afraid we have to go to the next uh, microphone. Please, sir. Hello, uh, thank you, ma'am. My name is Kevin Dooley. I've, I've been called an Irish Canadian heritage activist. It's kind of a misnomer dog's breakfast. But I'm interested in protect. Thank you for coming. It's a wonderful talk. And I was captured by, um, I have a question, but I was captured by the, the words, your, your brief description of your Ever, or your what you said as a convocation in Edmonton, and I think that seems to sum up what I get from what you're saying. Those two points you made. So on on those points, basically, uh, if I reiterate right, was uh, you're looking at the concepts of history uh, as correctly interpreted from the past as to where you are now, and the understanding that past is critical. Now the, the point, the, I think that's a very very important part, given you have. You can say here in Canada, right here where the hill is here, you can use the word, you can use without fear or favour the words colonial, i.e. British imperialism was at work in many ways. And, and now you give some credit to the scholars, and I think over duly to the scholars, but we in Canada, and, and I'm coming from Ireland now, you're going to get where this is coming from, we lived under that British colonial rule, uh, distorted the histories completely, absolutely, completely. You've been very friendly to them, you're very nice to them, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Very ladylike to them. But uh, having said that, it's wonderful to hear that voice coming out saying those words, and without fear of ever saying the words colonial interpretation of our histories, and being able to sort of take it to the next step. Because we're facing that in Canada in the last number of years. We've had an opening uh, and, and an awareness of, of the, the deeds that were done in the start and the history of this country. And Ireland plays a big part of it. Now, the question I have here is the relationship of your work, I think, is very important because as a British Commonwealth country, you're in the Commonwealth world. Ireland is part of that. And we're, as the Irish government is doing and, and people are doing, is learning to look at our history. Now, I'm just wondering in your work, when you look at the Celtic histories in Ireland, you spend a long time in London, the parallels, I'm wondering what they are. Uh, and for instance, Gaelic, I'm a Gaelic speaker, is an Indo European language. It's traced all the way back to the Middle East, 4,800 years old. Slice of history. There. So I'm just wondering, where are the parallels here with other cultures? And given that you're talking about the British Commonwealth, say India, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, where you can develop your, your, your work further? Because the British imperialist colonialist stamp, I that's the question. Yeah, you great. got it? She's got it. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think I've got it. <laughs> um, well, I think, yes, there have been parallels. You're, you're quite right that in the, in the whole discussion, for example, of, of um, Aryan foundations of culture and that kind of thing, on, on which there's been heated battles between uh, historians and um, people who largely belong to the uh, Hindutva group of thinking. Um, I think the, the, the importance of parallels is not so much what used to be thought earlier on many, many years ago. Um, oh, we have it, they have it. So obviously, we have something in common. Or we have it and they have it, so we influence them. And they will turn around and say, no, we influenced you. So this whole business of who influenced who became a very important issue and became a very important issue in all kinds of nationalist writing as well. What we've moved on to now is to say, ah, um, we have a particular kind of society which uh, some people refer to as a society of Aryan speakers and there's a Celtic society where the language is similar some customs are similar and so on. Uh, what are the questions that we can ask and what are the answers that we get from these two different societies which may in fact help us to understand our own societies in addition to understanding those societies? So what is happening is that the questions have changed. It's no longer if there are parallels who influenced who uh, it is a question of if there are parallels, how can we use those parallels to explore further a particular situation? Great. Thank you. Sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Prabhul Niyogi, and I do work for the Government of Canada. Uh, Professor Thapar, I think I can also claim to know one of your colleagues, 
This is Professor Shubhashachi Bhattacharya at oh, JNU, yes. whose wife is a very close friend. Mm. Uh, my question is a much safer one, because it has to do with the role of the Emperor Ashoka mm -hmm. in Indian history. The books we read, which were written by Brits, couldn't you know, sort of yeah. change that. And my question is, for a Western audience, is it worth comparing him to the Emperor Constantine and the role that Constantine the Great plays with respect to Christianity as Ashoka plays to Buddhism? Uh, the two questions which follow are, what is his role in Indian history and what influence do his ideas have even today? Because for the sake of this audience, I think it's worth pointing out that the Indian emblems, the four-headed lions, mm -hmm. and the wheel and the flag come from the Sanchi Stupa. Mm -hmm. um, well, your last question is much easier to answer. <laughs> um, Ashoka, Ashoka really becomes uh, the great emblem of tolerance, nonviolence, peace, harmony, and so on, which is the way in which historians did project him in the 1920s and the 30s. Um, and so the national movement picks up this emblem and this figure from the past and pr projects him to a much greater extent that he had been projected earlier. And I'll come to that in a moment. And actually, the, uh, the picking up of the emblem is largely the doing of people like Nehru. Nehru had a very strong sense of history. I mean, he may not have been the best of historians, but his books like The Discovery of India played a very major role in the way in which history was perceived and used as part of nationalism. And it was, it was Nehru more than anybody else who said, this has to be the icon of the new India. And therefore, the, the capital from his famous pillar at Sanchi uh, was placed on the national flag. Um, not on the national flag, it became the government emblem. And the wheel from that capital was mm. placed on the national flag. OK. Um, what was his role in history? We all assumed at a certain point that after he died, he was forgotten uh, for the simple reason that although he is mentioned repeatedly in the Buddhist texts, he is not referred to in the Brahmanical texts. In fact, in the dynastic lists included in a body of texts known as the Purans, he's simply mentioned as one of the kings of the Mauryan dynasty, and nothing more is said about him. Uh, the title that he took, Devanampiya, which means the beloved of the gods, uh, was made fun of by, in Brahmanical literature later on, and it was used as a title of contempt or you know, unimportant. However, what is happening now is uh, that we're beginning to uh, kind of perceive that possibly his ideas, and just not his ideas, but also Buddhism in general, which was eventually, as it were, declined and was kind of discarded in India, nevertheless had a very important role in a, in a number of major decisions and dis debates and discourses that went on. Um, for instance, the most recent work on this has been in a section of the Mahabharat, the Shanti Parvan, when uh, one of the heroes, Yudhishthir, is asked to take over the kingship. And he says, no, I don't want to be king. I want to be a renouncer. I'm going away. And his, uh, he is then persuaded slowly and gradually. And the whole discourse is one on kingship and renunciation which is, of course, a fundamental discourse in Buddhism, power and renunciation. That goes on. And there are some historians who are today saying that maybe Yudhishthir had in mind the image of Ashoka when he said, I don't want to be king. Uh, I would rather not have the power but be an ascetic and have a different kind of authority altogether. Because let's not forget that in Indian society, renouncers and ascetics were not people who just disappeared on the wayside. They were people of authority. People listened to them. Even kings had to listen to them and that kind of thing. Uh, so the argument is that throughout this period, there was a certain sense in which he is remembered and he's brought into these discussions even though he's not mentioned by name. Mm 
And the most interesting thing about him is that on his pillar, one of his pillars, which has the seven edicts, major edicts of his policy, uh, we have an inscription uh, inscribed 800 years later by Samudra Gupta, the Gupta king, where he's boasting of his campaigns and his majesty and so on. And one reads this inscription and says, if they could have read Ashoka's inscription saying nonviolence, would they have put in an inscription proclaiming the importance of violence in campaigns? And on the same pillar, again in the third, in the next millennium, you have a little inscription of Jahangir setting out his genealogy. So that you have three inscriptions in three different languages over three millennia on that same object. And I can't help but say there was a sense of the legitimacy of the past and the legitimacy of the original ruler who put on this edict, even if they couldn't read it. Romila, thank you for that. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, this is being streamed live. And we have a question from Toronto. Um, where Priya asks uh, what your opinion is of the way history is being taught in schools in India. Um, uh, Priya wonders about uh, a climate that seems to promote a Hindutva version of history um, at school and perhaps college levels. And uh, what are your thoughts on all of that? Gosh, that's another major question. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been centrally involved in this textbook controversy. Um, how is history being taught now? In very varied ways. Uh, it depends on the school. We have a whole range of schools. The really good schools are schools uh, which have been established by um, state schools. The, I'm not talking about private schools here, but state schools. Uh, which have been established by the Central Education Ministry, where there are good textbooks, uh, where there was a time when the Bharatiya Janta Party was in power. They wanted to do away with all the textbooks that we had written earlier and replace them with their own. And we had a tremendous public debate on this. It was really both um, depressing and exhilarating because it was depressing that there had to be a debate on a subject like this, but exhilarating that so many people participated and that you know the, the whole business of the interpretation of history became an important issue. Um, when the, the BJP went out of power and this government came in, they did away with all the existing textbooks and they started a new body of textbooks. They've written a new set. They're good. They're good textbooks and, and that's fine. The problem, of course, is that this particular kind of model textbook is controlled by um, a government organization, the NCERT, which means there is this fear that each time the government changes the textbooks, <laughs> the schools will change. And many of us have been advocating, unfortunately, with no effect, that this body should be made autonomous and that textbooks should not be under government control of any government because there's always this danger. But in addition to the state uh, textbooks, we have a whole range of other schools. We have private schools of different kinds. Uh, we have religious schools. There, there are the madrasas. There are the shishu mandirs, which are run by the RSS. There are the Gurdwara Prabhanda Committee schools which have a distinct religious orientation. And the kind of history that's taught there is not the kind of history that one wants to see being taught in school. Um, I think there is a great potential for arguing that there should be a body of people that are uh, people who, who examine textbooks, and that whatever the textbook, whoever has written it, has to pass through this body before it becomes acceptable as a textbook. And the body should consist not of members of religious organizations, but of historians. Because we have enough historians who are now competent to pass judgment on what is a good textbook. That is one thing which I think is essential. Secondly, I think that we don't use, uh, this is uh, an old complaint of mine, that we don't really use our media properly. We could have a television channel dedicated entirely to education. 
where we could use the textbooks with students in the morning and say, this is what it says. There are other books that also say this. And you could read this, and you could read that. And these are the reasons. Discussions among historians as to why a particular point of view is taken. Because ultimately, what one is really arguing about is not that there should be a single view of Indian history, but that history as a discipline must be understood, that you have to really go into this whole question of what is your evidence? Is it reliable? What is the generalization you're making? Is it logical? Is it rational? What, is, what are the causes that you're suggesting for particular situations? And this, this process of what we now fondly call the historical method which is something that is totally alien to groups like the Hindutva groups. This is what needs to be emphasized more and more. So the children learn how to think about a subject, leave alone just picking up information about a subject. Terrific, Ramla. I think with her, it's time for two more uh, uh, interventions. Sir, please. Um, hi, my name is Daniel Bentley. I'm also a civil servant. Um, my question concerns the uh, relationship between text and ritual, and it's uh, partly uh, following from something that you said earlier. Um, but I, if I can introduce it just a little bit. Uh, there are other traditions um, in which the relationship between foundational texts and rituals turns out to be much, much more complicated uh, than at first glance, and that's both in the Judeo-Christian and in the Muslim traditions. You talked about an over-concentration on the Vedic texts. And then you pointed out the variety and the complexity of rituals associated with different occasions and different tasks, uh, ta uh, sorry, castes and the interactions between Muslims and Hindus and so on. Nevertheless, is there a traceable unity, as there would be in other traditions? Is there a traceable unity uh, in the, in the text, this is, I'm afraid this is a very ignorant question in a way, is there a traceable unity that's, that spreads to, all the way to this complexity, even to perhaps to the extent of rituals that may be less and less literate, I'm guessing? Uh, and if so, does that cast any light on your original, that, that remark you made about the transmission of cultural elements when civilizations change? That's my question. Well, I think that texts, by their very nature, are uh, tend to be uniform, tend to have one statement which they keep on reiterating. So one wouldn't really find um, ideas across the board in the same text. But what you do find is that in the practice of the religions, uh, there would be recognition. I mean, when I say that there is a ritual being performed and you can tell immediately that this is a Vaishnava ritual which is being performed by uh, Brahmins or non-Brahmins, or whatever the case may be, that doesn't mean that a Shaiva or a Shakta or anybody coming there wouldn't also participate in that ritual. I mean, we have right through um, situations where people who are Hindus happily go along and worship at mus Muslim shrines and vice versa. This did happen and up to a point still happens uh, where the notion is really one of, well, it's one is worshiping a deity and it doesn't really terribly matter which deity one's worshiping, although one maintains and retains one's main worship for the particular deity that one wishes to worship. That, that is certainly there. Um, what this means in terms of the transmission of cultures is that I think, and I may be completely wrong here because I'm not a specialist on religion, but I think in the transmission of culture, cultures, because of the nature of the Hindu religion not being essentially of the same structure as Judeo-Christianity, there is a tendency to accept much more and internalize it as part of one's religion than in most other religions. 
I'm not sure, but this is, this is my guess. This is the feeling that I have. And this internalization takes the form really much more of observing rituals or going out and worshiping at shrines than of actually turning to texts. It's the practice which is much more open. Thank you, Romola. I think we have two more questioners. So if you can uh, uh, perhaps accommodate them both, and that would be easier if you were both a bit brief. Please, sir. I'm Noel Salmond. I teach in the College of the Humanities at Carleton University here in Ottawa. You mentioned the possible continuities between the Harappan civilization and the Vedic culture. And, and my understanding is that with the Harappan civilization, there's plenty of archaeological evidence, but no linguistic evidence, and it's the reverse with That's the Vedic. Right. There's mm -hmm. plenty of philological, linguistic evidence, but precious little okay. archaeological evidence. Could you tell us what the state of your thinking is on this whole vexed issue of the so-called Aryan migration, Aryan invasion? <laughs> Who are the Aryans? Where did they come from? Thank you. No small question. Uh. Yeah, I was hoping nobody would ask that. <laughs> um, it is a very vexed question in the sense that it's been unnecessarily made vexed by this insistence that are they indigenous or are they not? Um, again, it's a question of how we historians now look at this problem of the intermixing of cultures. Uh, my own take on it is that you had a very extensive Harappan civilization that went into Central Asia and Northwestern India and so on. And that you also had Indo-Aryan speakers who were in, uh, or Indo-European speakers who were in Central Asia and Iran, of which Indo-Aryan is one branch and Old Iranian is another branch. And the two are very, very close together. I know, no, we know that. Um, I think you get migrations of Indo-Aryan speakers coming in. And I'm very insistent on the fact that one doesn't talk about Aryans as people, but we talk about the Indo-Aryan language or the Aryan language. They're language speakers. Now, if you look upon them as language speakers, then the questions that you ask would be rather diff different. That is, how does that language come to be the dominant language of major parts of northern India. What is the process? So that's a different story altogether from either the early theory of invasions, which nobody accepts now, uh, or even other theories of the replacement of populations. What is really going on is that you've got possibly two, three more language speakers living in these areas who are mingling and merging and uh, the language is replaced. The Harappans, we know nothing about their language just yet. The script has not been deciphered. Uh, and some people say it's not even a script, but that's another story. Uh, the Aryans, you can't have archaeology of um, a language. You can only have archaeology of people whom you can identify as settlers. But if all you know is that the language changed, one doesn't really know what the archaeology is. Perhaps the archaeology that is already existing there, coterminous with the Harappan, that is, agro-pastoralists of various kinds living in the villages in Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, perhaps they were the ones who became the Indo-Aryan speakers. But this remains very much of a question mark. Terrific. Thank you, sir. Oh, Great. Right. Uh, well, Romola, thank you so much. It was a very rich experience, I think, for everyone in the room, whatever our level of knowledge. And mine isn't great, particularly on early uh, Indian history. Uh, to have you with us, to have you take us through uh, so many of these evolving ideas mm. on uh, how Indian history can be approached and eventually how it, how it can be interpreted. And, and from your remarks, I take that probably 50 years from now, uh, those sitting in our seats will be thinking other thoughts, building on. I hope so. <laughs> I building hope so. on uh, yes. terrific work that has been done. 
in recent years and uh, that continues. One wonderful thing about being a, an academic, it's, it's a great privilege often, is that one has students, and one's students take forward yeah. so much of what one has begun to ex excavate, right. but doesn't have the time fully uh, to do justice to. So I know there are generations of students who have worked with you and uh, who are very grateful for that. We've just had a small taste of it today, but uh, we all rejoice in the, the, the uh, decision that the University of Alberta made <laughs> to uh, honor you, and in our own more modest way today, we honor you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much.